we're going to show you how you can fly out of the Tijuana Airport from right here in San Diego for hundreds of dollars less than what you would pay to fly out of the San Diego Airport. He owned more than 100 slaves, so why is a local school named after him? Working for you, an update on the fight to change things here at Henry Clay Elementary. Local farmers donating their fresh surplus food to hunger relief organizations. And Larry Himmel once wanted to know if he was smarter than a four-year-old. And 10 years later, Grayson wants a rematch. CBS 8 News Live at 6 starts now. This coming holiday weekend kicks off the summer travel season, and experts say it could be one of the busiest ever. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Carla Chiquetta. I'm Marcella Lee. Tonight, we're taking you inside the San Diego terminal that connects passengers to the Tijuana Airport in Mexico. You can save hundreds of dollars and a lot of travel time. CBS 8's Anna Laurel joins us right now from the Cross Border Express in Otay Mesa. Anna? That's right, you guys. I'm in the terminal for Tijuana Airport right here in San Diego in Otay Mesa. Earlier today, the COO, the chief operating officer, he gave us a walkthrough to show us exactly what to do to make sure this is smooth. If you come through here, like check out these kiosks. You can actually buy your CBX ticket, your Cross Border Express ticket here. Here's a pro tip. Do it before you get here. When we pulled up today, the curb was full of San Diegans already in the know. It's easy. Piece of cake. I recommend it. Highly recommend it. Aida and her friends just got back from a girl's trip to Puerto Vallarta. How much did it cost? Oh my gosh, about $125. They flew out of the Tijuana Airport through Cross Border Express in Otay Mesa. I think our plane ticket was about $130. Do you remember how much the one out of San Diego was at the time? I think it was about 500 for our CBS 8 crew. It was an easy drive here. Paid parking is available. CBX is a pedestrian bridge exclusively for passengers of the Tijuana Airport. You can cross between the United States and Mexico without ever leaving the airport. We are a unique scenario in the world where we are terminal of the airport on the American side. This is basically Tijuana in Southern California. Here's what you need, your passport, boarding pass, a CBX ticket that you link to your boarding pass, and an immigration form. This is the FMM form. This is basically your immigration form that you need to present to Mexican Customs if you are non-Mexican resident. Here's a pro tip, buy your round trip CBX ticket and fill out your immigration form both online before you come. You can do both though once you're here. All the form is taken from your passport and the address is done and that's how we pass immigration. Special services are available for unaccompanied minors and people who need a wheelchair. Before you go through the electronic gates, staff make sure you have what you need. So this is where you basically be uh, scanning your boarding pass and then you go right through. And beyond these doors is the indoor pedestrian bridge that takes you across the border. You walk about six minutes and then you will arrive at Mexican immigration, then Mexican customs, then you would have the airlines where you drop off your suitcase if you checked in anything else. Then airport security and you're in the airport. Yes, you're in the airport. So remember, this is only if you have a boarding pass and a flight out of the Tijuana airport. This isn't if you want to just go to lunch over in TJ. Live here at the Cross Border Express in Otay Mesa, I'm Anna Laurel for CBS 8. Carlo. So Anna, why? Why are tickets so much less to fly out of the Tijuana airport than, say, San Diego International or maybe even LAX? Yeah, you know what, Carlo? Of course, we asked them that. Well, what's the secret? He said, well, this is domestic flights we're talking about here to go to Cabo, Cancun, Puerto Vallarta from TJ. That's a domestic flight, so you pay a lot less in taxes. But it's not just money you're saving. When I looked on Expedia for flights from San Diego International to Puerto Vallarta, the cheapest flights, get this, they had travel times of like 25 hours and a lot of connections. You're not doing that out of the Tijuana International Airport. Some good travel tips for you there. Anna Laurel reporting for us. Thanks, yeah. Anna. Okay, we're seeing some disturbing images. We want to warn you from the U.S. Border Patrol tonight of a four-year-old child being dropped from the top of the border wall. CBP Chief Roel Ortiz shared this video. He says the child is okay, but this should serve as a warning not to trust smugglers. We first told you about this incident last Monday night. Agents and first responders say they were giving the child first aid when they heard gunshots near their position. No injuries from the gunfire was reported. 
We are learning tonight that a man from San Diego was among at least 10 people shot and killed at a road racing event in Mexico. Investigators say Roberto Isaias Ayala, who also went by the name Tito, died in Baja, California on Saturday night when a gunfight broke out. The Baja, California State Attorney General says the shootout involved organized crime groups. So far, no arrests have been made. A man accused of attempting to sexually assault a woman in her home in Barrio Logan pleaded not guilty this afternoon. Darius Hargrove appeared virtually in court. San Diego police say he broke into a woman's home back on March 25th. They say Hargrove was gone by the time officers got there. When they later identified him, he was already in jail on unrelated charges. The judge issued a protective order for the woman today. Hargrove will be back in court in June. He is being held on $1 million bail. Today, the San Diego City Council appointed 25 members to the new Commission on Police Practices, but it will be a while before they take any action. This is a citizen's oversight board that could suggest disciplinary action for alleged officer misconduct. The commission will be able to subpoena documents and witnesses, but before they can start reviewing cases, they must undergo background checks and training. That could take up to a year and a half. This measure was approved by voters back in 2020. Some parents in Rolando are fighting to change the name of their local elementary school. They say Henry Clay Elementary is named after a man who not only kept slaves, but was responsible for the expansion of slavery into other states. They've been working on this effort for months now, but say the school district has not exactly been helpful. CBS 8 Steve Price has been working for you to get answers from the district and joins us live now from the school with an update. Steve. And Marcella and Carl, you probably noticed that just over my shoulder is the sign for Henry Clay Elementary, but I actually want to step out of the way so you can see the picture that is right below that sign. That's Nelson Mandela, and parents say, you know, putting a picture of a man who fought against racial segregation under the name of a slave owner doesn't fix the problem. They say they want the school's name changed. Henry Clay was elected to Congress in the early 1800s and is still considered one of the greatest U.S. Senators of all time. But the man who has an elementary school in Rolando named after him also fought to keep enslaved people on his property. The school is named after someone who enslaved 122 people. Jared Tucker is one of several parents with children at the school who have spent the last several months trying to get the name changed but seem to be getting nowhere with the San Diego Unified School District. Talk to this person, that person says, talk to that person, and then that person says, talk to this person. Of course, it's frustrating. Jared finally got so tired of getting the runaround that he showed up at a recent school board meeting and shared his concerns during public comments. For decades, students in this district have been forced to walk into buildings and wear shirts emblazoned with the names of men that would have seen them as less than human. And that needs to stop now. The parents who call their group not okay with Clay got a huge endorsement last week. A letter from City Council President Sean Ela Rivera that included the line, Today I request action to remove this shameful and racist image from our school. It felt validating and exciting that this is not acceptable in our community. This is somebody that does have power. This is somebody that does have capital to change this. So you feel heard. CBS 8 has been working for you on this story since March when we were told by school officials that no action could be taken because the parents didn't submit a formal proposal for a name change. The parents have now done that, but still nothing from the school board. So we reached out to the district again today. They now confirm they've received a proposal and are working to reestablish a school names committee, which will make a recommendation to the board. The parents feel like they're being asked to jump through a lot of hoops, which they'll do, but wonder why do they have to? Why should it be up to the parents? Why should it be up to the community? They know, they know who these schools are named after. They know who named them. So they should be doing that work moving forward. Yeah, their argument, the board should be the ones who are initiating this process, not concerned parents. So I asked the district, I said, hey, now, now that the ball is rolling, you admit that. When can we expect to see the change? They said, we don't know how long this will take. But Brian says he was told it could take three to five years, Marcelo and Carlo, and he says that is not acceptable. Steve, has there been any opposition to changing the name of the school? Marcelo, they have had two different town halls, and they say there was no opposition at either one of those town halls, but Brian did tell me that he has heard from two people, one a neighbor, one a parent at the school, who told him that they thought that he was erasing history. They were against the move. 
Interesting. We'll have to see how that all plays out uh, once they do follow the procedure and that gets addressed by the school board. Thanks, Steve. And here at CBS 8, we'd like to help solve problems affecting you. If there's something you'd like us to look into, you can email us at workingforyou at cbs8.com. When it comes to California schools, Governor Gavin Newsom has set aside more money for a bill to screen children for dyslexia at an early age. The governor himself has dyslexia. As our political reporter Morgan Reiner tells us, it's the first time that he's back to this type of plan. Megan Potante is an educator. I was a classroom teacher and a reading specialist, a special education teacher. Um, and, you know, that's really my passion to help uh, all achieve literacy. But above all else, she's a mother. My son showed early signs of, of challenge of starting in kindergarten, first, second grade, and was really struggling to learn to read. As a mother and an educator, she felt like the state was letting down her kids. As a teacher myself, um, you know, I wasn't trained in my teacher preparation programs um, best in the best ways to support um, early reading. So she became an advocate, a state director for Decodifying Dyslexia California, and teamed up with Senator Anthony Portentino. I was one of those kids back in the 70s that uh, grew up with uh, unrecognized uh, learning disability. My mother didn't find out till I was in the eighth grade that I had dyslexia. Portentino has pushed for early screening for years, but there were concerns from the California Teachers Association that mandatory screening had the potential to over-identify and misplace students in special ed, especially English language learners. English learner population was getting misdiagnosed, misidentified under the current system. Portentino said changes were made to his bill to create linguistically sensitive tests, but then he decided to hold the bill back because the governor wanted to include it in his budget. They wanted to know if I was okay not being the author of the bill, and I said, absolutely. If we get kids to read, I don't need to author the bill. We just need it to get done. Morgan Ryan reporting for us. Better diagnostic tools, better outcomes for students, hopefully. Yeah, it looks like a, a good program to be able to identify that early. The earlier, the better.